Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Towards the end of chapter one of his work, Language, Truth, and Logic, A.J. Ayer is going to discuss a general way, in his view, how metaphysical propositions or assertions or claims wind up getting made. And remember that for Ayer, generally metaphysical is, is going to be not, not a good thing. Actually, technically, you can't say it's good or bad, because in his view, metaphysical assertions are actually meaningless or nonsense. They fail the criterion of verifiability, and they're not actually tautologies either, things that are logically necessary because of the structure of our language. So they're going to be problematic, and, and part of his goal is to try to show that, that these really don't say anything or assert anything. And, you know, after doing that, he says that what we want to do is to show how metaphysical assertions or propositions or statements come to be made. What is going on when we're doing this? And the general idea is that we're seduced by some of the strange quirks of our language so that we take, um, as he says, uh, we postulate real non-existent entities uh, which are resulting from the superstition that there must be real entities corresponding to grammatical subjects. So because we name something and talk about it in language, we assume there must be something corresponding to it, and we are thereby being misled or seduced by some of the features of our very own language. Another way of uh, framing this, this is a linguistic problem rather than an actual metaphysical problem. So one of the prime examples that he uses is referencing Martin Heidegger's famous statement that the nothing nothings, you know, das nicht nicht it, uh, which uh, you know, has been attacked by the logical positivists, as not just meaningless, but uh, a great example of Heidegger's obs, you know, obfuscation uh, of language and his messiness and, and perhaps even being totally misled himself in thinking that in talking about nothing, we're actually talking about anything. I mean, to be fair, Heidegger does very carefully say, nothing isn't something, right? but you could still make the, the criticism that What's going on here is mistaking the fact that we have a name or a word for something, even if it's a really weird one, like a privative, nothing, and thinking that it must correspond to, if not something, at least, you know, something out there in, in a different sense that we could attribute uh, things to or say something about. And in, to be fair, in Heidegger's work, the nothing does some work, right? Particularly in what is metaphysics. So that, that's an interesting example that Ayer is bringing up. Another that I think is a little bit easier to relate to if we think about the history of philosophy is this question about the reality of universals. You know, what is bookness? You know, the, this is a book. What is the essence of being a book? Is it a property that all books have in common? Or is it perhaps a platonic form? Or is it an idea in the mind of God? Or is it some sort of thing in this book itself? 
There's a lot of different versions of the problem of universals. And Ayer is saying, listen, there, there really shouldn't be any problem of universals because universals don't have reality as entities. We just think that they do because we're seduced once again by our grammar. The fact that we can talk about universals, we can say books do certain things, you know, books are wonderful, right? Uh, reading is fundamental. What, what is this reading that you're talking about? Is it all of the acts of reading combined? Is it some sort of substantive? So those are the sorts of things that, that Ayer has in mind. And he says that the, the general problem is that we assume that because we can predicate something of a subject that that subject is therefore an entity. It, it exists in some way. Um, so a prime example of this, he talks about it at great length is substance. And he's, he mentions, he talked about this a little bit earlier. He says that it happens to be the case that we cannot in our language, he means English, of course, but we can think of pretty much all the Indo-European languages, right? We cannot refer to the sensible properties of a thing without introducing a word or phrase which appears to stand for the thing itself as opposed to anything which may be said about it. Let's take it as an example, book, right? So this book is black and white and uh, pinkish in, in color. It is a short book. It is, in fact, an old book, as you, you, you could tell if you're looking at it. It is written in English. These are all properties of book, but we could say, well, there's a book and then it has those properties. First, you have a book, a subject, and then you have all of these things that's like Aristotle would call accidents, right? Or qualities or, you know, pick whatever other thing, you know, you want to say about it. And the book can be, we can say the book is in space over here or the book is now smacking me in the head. All these different things we can, we can predicate about it. The book smells like old books, right? All of those sorts of things. So it says that, that we've got this idea of the thing that underlies the sensible properties. Why do we assume that? Because our language leads us into thinking that, but our language is seducing us, leading us astray. It says we use the term substance to refer to the thing itself. We can do that in a generic sense and talk about substance. So like, you know, the substance of this or the substance of, of this chalkboard, the substance of my tie, the substance of my own flesh. And we can talk about each of those individual substances as well and what they are. It says we use the term substance to refer to the thing itself from the fact that we happen to employ a single word to refer to a thing and make that word the grammatical subject of the sentences in which we refer to the sensible appearances of the thing. He says there's two mistakes that we make here. One is thinking that it follows that the thing itself is a single and simple entity. This book, you know, could be understood as an assemblage of pages, for example, and there's no more reason for us to focus on the bookness, the, the unity of this, than there is on the parts of it, I suppose, or the, the different qualities. The other thing he says is that there's no reason to think that a thing cannot be defined in terms of the totality of its appearances. So there's no thing behind the appearances of this book, this thing just is all those appearances, the whiteness, blackness, uh, pinkness, the smell of the old book, the, all the you know, multiple things with all these letters and underlining the qualities that it has of length and depth and breadth and all, all of those things, the sound that it makes when I smack it on the stool. All of these things are the book. There is nothing beyond it. So you might think about, you know, Descartes' uh, famous, you know, piece of wax example where he looks at the thing in terms of its qualities and then he brings the wax close to the fire. He says all of its qualities are changing. What, what underlies it? Well, it's the substance itself of the wax, which is an extended thing. Error is saying we don't have to assume that. Our language leads us to think about that, but we don't have to buy into that. Another example, a little bit more abstract, the metaphysical concept of being. He says that our language has, unfortunately, in his view, 
the same grammatical form used for existential and attributive propositions. Now, what are existential and attributive propositions? Saying that the book is uh, old is attributive. You're saying this, this object here has the property of agedness or uh, it, it is a certain you know, time period uh, of, of age or it's from a certain period or whatever, however we're going to construe being old, right? We don't have to have a perfect uh, understanding in order to make this work. To say the book is or the book exists, that's an existential statement. Do you see the difference between the two? For one, you're asserting that something has existence, that it is in being. For the other, you're saying how it is, what, what sort of attributes, what sort of properties, what sort of observations we can make of it. Now, you can observe that something exists, and you can also observe that something exists in a certain way, that it has properties, right? So he says uh, here that a simpler and clearer instance in the, in the way in which a consideration of grammar leads to metaphysics is the case of the metaphysical concept of being. The origin of our temptation to raise questions about capital B being about which uh, no conceivable experience would enable to answer, lies in the fact that in our language, sentences which express existential propositions and sentences which express attributive propositions may be of the same grammatical form. So he uses an example here that leads us a little bit astray, but we'll come back to the being itself in a sec. The sentences martyrs exist and martyrs suffer illustrates this difference. Saying martyrs exist, existential statement. Saying martyrs suffer, attributive statement. They're both uh, grammatically quite similar. They're a noun followed by an intransitive verb. The fact that they have grammatically the same appearance leads one, he says, to assume that they are of the same logical type. Now, what about being as such? Um, can we actually talk about being as such? It depends on what you mean by talk. Yes, we, we can. We could say being exists. We can string those terms together because we have uh, the verb, you know, to be turned into a gerund, right? Being, um, or um, we, could, we could do it with other things as well. We could say to be exists, or we could come up with all sorts of other things, uh, the beingness of beings or whatever we want. Grammatically, we can do that. In terms of whether we're saying something meaningful, Air would say it's a whole different issue. Saying being exists is not the same thing as asserting that the book exists. The book is an actual thing, right? It could exist or I could destroy it and now it no longer exists. You have to ask yourself, well, what, what is actually meant by being? How would you empirically verify this sort of thing? And the answer is, from the perspective air is uh, working out, you can't. So really you're just saying nonsense in talking about being existing or being loving us or any other thing that you might say about being. Uh, the last one that he talks about is fictional things. And he uses the example of unicorns. So when we say things like dogs are faithful and unicorns are fictitious, um, we're, again, being misled by grammar. We're thinking that, he says, there's an assumption that these are of the same logical type. So when we say that things are fictitious, like unicorns, we are asserting that they have this property of being fictitious. And you could say, well, wait a second. How the hell can you assert a property of something if it doesn't exist? You can't say the book is black if the book isn't black. Well, you can. I mean... The books in Sherlock Holmes study are presumably bound in leather and of all sorts of different rich colors or something like that. Sherlock Holmes is taller than Watson. Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. And his apartment at whatever Baker Street never presumably existed. I don't know. There might have been some model that it was drawn from by Arthur Conan Doyle. But he's a fictional character, is he not? So how, is it, how does it work for fictional things? Air says that our grammar misleads us into this assumption that fictitious things are real in some non-empirical mode. And Air says, well, there isn't any non-empirical mode of being real. That's what it means to be real. 
We're being, once again, misled by the way our language works. So these are all examples in Ayer's view of how metaphysics gets generated out of not paying close enough attention to how our language works and important distinctions that we might want to draw about our language.